Hello. I didn't see you there. Hi, uh, I'm Scott, and do I just talk into this microphone? Cool. How's it going, friends? Uh, I'm here with uh, with Adrian. How are you? Doing well, thank you very much. One of my top ten favorite Canadians, uh, and uh, we brought a bunch of things to show, which I think would be fun. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and uh, will you? Do I push the buttons, or do you push the buttons? Push the buttons as okay. you see fit. Okay. So this is showing host. Okay. We'll take you over so to your PC. what we want to talk about is is .NET specifically for tiny devices. Right. How tiny? Like I have a Raspberry Pi, but it runs an entire operating system. Right. So the Raspberry Pi, I'm a huge fan of. It's really it's a it's a tiny computer. It's a full micro uh, microprocessor. Processor, yeah. Uh, we're actually run .NET on a microcontroller. Okay. Microprocessor, microcontroller. It's small, but like processor controller, uh, you know, potato, potato. Yeah. So think less power, a lot less power. So uh, much more capable of running off battery. Doesn't require full operating systems. We're not going to have this whole Windows environment that we see on, say, a Windows laptop or a Raspberry Pi. Okay, so these don't boot into full operating systems that are multi-layered with kernels and drivers and ho and user mode and a shell and da 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 da, -da. Right, yes. So essentially these end up being, when you write your app for a micro uh, controller, you're gonna basically write a single purpose um, product. You're gonna run an application and the only thing that really that's effectively running and executing is your application. Okay, this makes me think well, about how like, you know when you run something in a container, you don't necessarily run like a full Ubuntu and then your tiny app. You run like Alpine or something with a tiny surface area. These little operating systems are, they call real-time operating systems, right? They have a very small surface area. Right, yes. They do the minimum. And so they, they do the minimum, so your application gets the most of the resources. I mean, they are constrained with devices, mm -hmm. um, but as well, they also end up being very, very stable. Because they're really just running your application. You boot almost, you're booting into .NET effectively. You're booting into a tiny operating system which runs your one app. Yes. Okay. And in can this we, case, Mono as well. Can we share the screen or do we do a picture in picture? I want to push this. This is very exciting for me. All right. Cool. So uh, this, uh, I'm not associated with uh, this company. I just think it's really cool. Uh, uh, Wilderness Labs, uh, they have like Netduino and Meadow. And what we're talking about here is Meadow. So it's a platform that uh, runs .NET Standard 2.0. And .NET Standard 2.0 is really great because it means that it's C-sharp code that you're writing to a standard that, you know, I could write a console app. And it would do stuff. I could write a console. I could write that library and put it in the cloud, or I could take a library and, depending on how I wrote it, if I wrote it to a standard, I could put it on this tiny device. Absolutely. So you can use all the great C sharp skills that you've developed building mobile applications, desktop applications, cloud applications, and apply those skills to making IoT applications. Right. Right. And one of the things that's really interesting about this idea of a uh, microcontroller is that, uh, as as uh, Brian from Wilderness Labs likes to say, is it's going to become the dominant form of computing. Like there's more microcontrollers than there are like people. Yeah, absolutely. And we think about this a lot in consumer world, with things like like Nest and you know home automation, but that's really a small portion of that market. And I think it's really it's it's industry and automation where there's huge numbers of these devices already deployed mm -hmm. and we're seeing a really big growth in that area. So when you think about Internet of Things, these things are not necessarily going to boot into Windows or boot into Mac or boot into Ubuntu. They're going to boot into a, a tiny real time operating system. Yeah, and I think the way I think about it is Often you don't need those full OSs, yeah. and there are there are cases where you want that, and sure. um, you know, like think like point of sale systems, where they might have a little more functionality. But mm -hmm. for a lot of things running behind the scenes for automation, we want those things super efficient, super um, super stable, mm -hmm. and um, and obviously very secure. Exactly. And who needs the headache of an entire giant operating system when you can go and do something like this now? Let's think about specifications. We know when the the Raspberry Pi has been thirty five dollars. It's a micro processor. 35 bucks and it has you know gigahertz right and, you know, quad processor gigahertz four gigs eight gigs of ram look at this 16 megs of ram 200 megahertz but it's also got wi-fi it's got bluetooth and it can go and do things like jpeg acceleration but with these small specs i can still run a dotnet application absolutely so dotnet i think about as being either interpreted just in time compiled or ahead of time compiled how are we doing that so we are running a full mono on this. So it is, oh, I, I make sure I don't misspeak here, but I believe we are, I, it should be JIT compiled. And then. Well, in this case here, we're going to boot into this little application with a, a build that we built locally and then we sent across the wire onto this tiny device. Let me actually do a little trick here. If you don't mind, uh, Jeff Fritz, can I just run my camera locally here? There so this go. is my camera. Surprise, it's going to be freaky. Hey, friends. Okay, uh, look at this. This is what the device looks like. 
how tiny that is, like a stick of gum. Okay, smaller than the size of your finger. Little tiny thing. Very, very light. Runs battery life could be measured in days and weeks and not hours as it is. Absolutely. With the Pi. Okay, so check this out. Look at this, friends. Look what we did for you. I don't know if this will actually work because of mirrored images. Let's do this. We'll cheat. And you talk about the size here, and keep in mind, this actually is a prototyping board. This is a development board, and so this will be an open source, open hardware project. So you can, of course, make this into your own hardware projects and make mm -hmm. this even smaller. Isn't that fun? So this is the development board, and as you're, as to your point, it could be smaller. You could build this into anything. Yes. And what's fun about this is that you can go and use whatever makes you happy. For example, we've got in my little kit here all kinds of stuff we could potentially play with. I've got a soil moisture sensor. I've got LCD screen, like a segmented display. I've got e-ink. You can see here we wrote on e-ink. You could potentially do a tricolor e-ink here that we got from Adafruit. There's potential there. Lots of different things that we could do. Um, but when I'm writing this code, you know, like let's see what it looks like. Is that cool with you? Yes, absolutely. All right. So this is the part that I'm so excited about. So I'm just going to go into Visual Studio here. And uh, let's do this. I've got two things to show you. First, let's open up Visual Studio again, and I'm going to go into my GitHub, and let's look at this e-ink display, if that's OK with you. Yes, absolutely. E-paper, e I think we call that. And I want to point out here that, we're, of course, you're opening up Visual Studio 2019. Yeah, that's a good point. I could open up Visual Studio code and edit it as a text file, because these are just C-sharp. But let's look at this. This is actually Visual Studio uh, 2019, and I just added a Visix. You know, I added an extension to it to make this work with, with Meadow. But let's take a look at, for example, this e-paper. I'm just going to right-click on this, and I'm going to say Edit Project File. Okay, and look at that CSProj here. Okay, we're targeting, look, the Meadow SDK in this sense. Now, in this here, it's pretending to be Net472, which is what Mono supports. Uh, but if we go and look at one of these displays, go look at these. So we've got these different libraries that use the Meadow Foundation. And then, let's go on and look at the program itself. Check this out. I'm going to go ahead and make that bigger here. Just make an instance of our new app, and then basically chill out. So we look inside this. I love this. It's an app of type F7 Micro, which is that chip that we're using here on this particular device, right? Yeah, exactly. So this will match the, the hardware, the form factor. So in the future, other boards will come out, and we can swap in which uh, makes that sense, hardware profile. Which makes sense, because the Meadow platform could work on other things, and you'd have an app of that type as well, which is really, really cool. And if we go in here and we say, like, initialize hardware, I understand that with uh, microcontrollers, there's different buses. There's different ways to talk to things. What is an SPI bus? So that's the Serial Peripheral Interface. And it's a fairly well-known, it's a standard communication protocol. Um, Generally, it's it's good for high speed devices, and you'll mm -hmm. see it's used in a lot of these types of displays, for example, because yep. it's good for pushing a lot of data. And, and this is interesting because you see right here, there's this this right this 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 uh, ribbon almost. We've effectively made our own ribbon cable here. Yes, yeah, exactly. Right, and it looks like we've got eight bits going across that into a number of things. You've got your ground, your power, and then a little bus here. How big's the bus? Four of these or three or or six of these. So the bus itself is actually two wires, there's but there's two. there's a few extra things for various bits of control. So there's um, you got your power and your ground over here. Power and your ground. Um, and you've got DO through DO three, and then you've got SCX and then MOSI. Yeah. So there's there's a clock signal for SPI, which is just to make sure that the two devices are talking at the same right, time. They're working at the same time. Um, yeah. And then MOSI is master out slave in, which is sort of old school technology. We don't usually say master slave anymore, but that's the standard for SPI. Okay. The meadow in this case is the master, and the screen is the it would be the it's slave the or the secondary. Receiver. Yeah. Um, and then you see the meso, which would be if you had devices that were sensors that were reading data in from the world, and had to push that data back to the meadow board. Mm -hmm. And then there's a, a reset pin, a data command pin. There are just some extra pins generally used in SPI. Mm -hmm. I won't go into the details right now, but sure, they're sure. common to wire up. And we use those when the GPIO pins on Meadow. And what I'm finding really great about this platform, and I'm on Windows and you're on a Mac, I'm going to go out here because there's a tool that I ended up using to just plug this in. I wrote a blog post about this. So you can just flash this on Windows. It was really easy with this thing called DFU. Uh, I did this one time just to install the operating system, and I yes. haven't thought about this since. This is not like it used to be hard to do this kind of work, and you'd go and install generic USB drivers and all <laughs> this kind of stuff. But all I had to do was just plug the Meadow in with USB, 
showed up as a serial port. Yes, yeah. That seems to be the, the nice, clean, generic way to do things. It showed up as a serial port, and I said, oh, it's on COM port 3. Yes, exactly. And then from within my application here in Visual Studio, look, I can go and say right-click, deploy, and I got a nice, clean experience. Yes. And you do have this on Visual Studio on the Mac as well. Absolutely on the Mac. And, and you mentioned the COM port, and one thing that's really nice about that, of course, is Windows, Mac OS supports multiple COM ports, mm -hmm. uh, which can allow us to have multiple devices plugged in simultaneously and select which ones to deploy in the future. Yep. And then the, the, we have this concept of a driver. And this isn't like a driver, like a .sys file or a, something on. Um, oh, we've got a question here. Well, you can feel free to just throw so, questions in and uh, jump in. Quick question here. Script23 asks, is the board powered only by the USB port? That, that is a great question. That is a great question. Um, depends so on, It depends on if you're developing or not, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. So when we're developing, we'll just plug in the micro USB cable, and that will power the board. Uh, now, of course, if you are using peripherals that require more power, you know, our displays are probably, you'll, you'll see one that's backlit, and that's probably about the limit of how much power you want to pull through the meadow, so you might want to have external power. Mm -hmm. And then once you've got, um, you know, a hardened solution, something you want to deploy in the field, uh, meadow can be powered off battery as well, and there's actually right. a battery port right on the end. And the, a reminder again, there. this is in fact a, and I'll go ahead and bring the camera up again, this is a development board, but when we switch back over to here, you can see come something interesting. You can see your micro USB here, and then I can power that off a LiPo. Yes, yes. And I've done that. Or I have a little lithium poly ion oh, battery. And that works really great as well. And those can last for a very long time. And again, this is the development board. The other one will be uh, a different size. Um, and to this point, actually, let's try something a little more sophisticated than e-ink, because the e-ink is effectively hello world. Yeah. But I, I wanted to challenge us to do something more interesting. Right? Perfect. So let's do that. I'm going to go back over here, and I'm going to say recent projects. And I'm going to go back over into my FM radio. OK, so check the look at this here. This was uh, challenging. We've been working on this this afternoon. And, uh, and by we, I mean you, and I was also there. Uh, but I get to, uh, to take lots of credit for it. And I thought this was super fun, because what Adrian Winton did here is he made an FM radio. Yes. And I wanted to explain this concept to folks that understand .NET, because I thought it would be a, a fun way to do it here. So what we've got, and I'll go ahead and put my camera back on here. So we're going to do this. Check this out. Okay, friends. So we've got a radio. There we go. Thank you, sir. We've got a radio here. We've got the meadow board here. We've got some buttons over here. There's the meadow. Now, we happen to be powering it over uh, USB, but it doesn't yeah. have to be that way. But I want to be yeah. able to debug it and, you know, kind of do the stuff I want to do. And, um, oh, here we go. We can actually... It's, oh, it's upside down. Oh. <laughs> it's, I've got it upside down. Here, watch. I'm going to flip around the other side. No, it's okay. I'll do it like this. There we go. All right. So what we're doing here is we're listening to the local public radio station here in Seattle or in Redmond, where we happen to be. Okay. So what I'm going to do, friends, is why don't you do me a favor, Jeff Fritz? I want you to hold this. And I'm going to hold that there. And what we've got is our speakers. Here, let's plug that in. Oh, we're getting some. I think we're in a building here, so. Yeah. You oh, can't yeah. Really, you can't really hear it. In here. Here, hold that. And then we're going to have this. Isn't that cool? So, what we've done here, and I'll go ahead and unplug the, the speakers because that's, that's fun. Oops. Oh, so how would we do a radio, right? How would we do a radio, friends? Let's look at this. It's it's fun because I like it because it's model view controller. Okay, think about this. Goldness is requesting uh, radio stations, I guess, songs. No, now they're things. requesting radio stations. <laughs> Come on. We're not taking requests here, people. What's wrong with you? When I say model view controller, this is my construction, not a meadow thing. But I thought about this, and it's like, well, there's the view. Right. Absolutely. Here's the here's the model. Here's the database, the thing, the web service, the object, the the model, the physical model, and then in this context, the .NET code is the controller. Yeah, I and, love this. Isn't that great? And then you've got your buttons there that will set it to mute or to scan forward to the next FM radio station, which is really really cool. 
This is the kind of cool stuff. Now, again, this is a prototype that we've made. If we're going to go and sell our radio now, we need to put it in an enclosure in a box. Yeah, exactly. And so, of course, you could cool with it. It's a great opportunity to start you know, 3D printing to get your first first engineering sample going. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, and then, yeah, I, I don't quote me on all the parts, but most of these are, are standard off the shelf. So it should be no problem to you know make a custom board. And uh, Okay, so fine. could this run .NET Core 3, right? So right now it's using Mono, but in some theoretical future, as .NET Core and Mono merge, then I assume you'll be able to share a lot of that code. Yeah, so... Um, Maybe in the .NET 5 time frame. Yes, yeah. <laughs> I think you would know better than I would, but I, I believe there's some some there's some. Want so the to the, in, the intent is to reconcile the .NETs into a single .NET, and Mono right now is really. Let's, let's talk about that for a second. Mono makes sense for something like this because it's clean, portable C code. It's got a great, easy to build code environment. Yes. Uh, Mono is portable. Mono can run on a, a Nintendo Switch or a Wii, right? Because it's so portable. So the ability to be able to go and take mono and then take some of the ahead of time compilation things and modify it in such a way that it works in such a small device is important. But uh, in the future, we're gonna take .NET Core, .NET Framework and mono and merge them into some kind of unified thing. Now those plans are years out, two years out, but uh, certainly I don't see any reason why they couldn't, but I don't know if I can speak for uh, for yeah. the folks at uh, Wilderness Labs. Yeah, and and, I, and without overstating, the goal is to make sure that still it's, it's the want is for it to be a modern development experience. Yeah. So exactly. I think as .NET evolves, you'll see the Meadow platform evolve, uh, and you know as you mentioned the start, you know supporting .NET standard. Yeah. And that's a really nice way to share your code between .NET Core and .NET Framework. Well, and let's talk about that for a second because if we look at the code here, let's remind ourselves. So the the, the individual said, could it run .NET Core three? And the question is. Does it matter? Because in this case, if it is running to a standard, if you have the functions that you're used to having, then it doesn't really matter. Your code is reusable. Exactly, yes. But in the context of these kind of single-tasked applications, let's call this a single-tasked radio application, um, as soon as I do something that's specific to a piece of hardware, um, if I'm on Windows and I decide to go and do talk to the registry, right? I'm using .NET Core 3, but I'm talking to the registry. Right, so now you've got a, a desktop specific application. Or I just became specific. Windows specific. Yeah. I can't do the registry on Ubuntu. If I am doing a Raspberry Pi application and I talk to a GPIO pin, let's say that I hard code it to GPIO 7. Now it's not only Raspberry Pi specific, but it's specific to a wiring diagram the way I made it. Then again, no matter what .NET it's been written in, it's now married to the, the system. So if we go back over here, I like the way you did this. You've got your digital output for your LED, your input for your mute button. Let's look at initialize hardware. What's great about this is that it's C-sharp and I know how to read it. And you go and you say, hey, this pin is for output. And this pin, number 12, which we've looking at our thing here, yes, we pin that for 12. And then you go and get the bus ready. And then you let us know, zero, one, two, those are the pins that that device for the display is sitting on. Set the contrast. Then we have an I2C bus, another kind of bus. Another kind of bus, exactly. That's the one that the FM tuner is using. Mm -hmm. And then we've got this uh, TEA5767. You can go and Google for that uh, with Bing and learn about that particular uh, FM radio, which sits on that bus. So yes. you see how you're chaining those together. And then here, we're just hard coding it in the, to, to start out with uh, the local radio station. And then we've got a search button, the button is then hooked up and you'll see that there's a nice event there to go and say button change. So it's a very familiar experience. Yeah, and one thing I love to call out here is typically for these kind of applications, you're able to do all of the hardware, kind of the, you know, the, also the software wiring, but the hardware plumbing mm -hmm. in a single method. We have an initialized method. Yeah. And that's really the only place you need to do that, any hardware interaction. Otherwise, it's just C Sharp and .NET. So it's all just familiar coding. Mm -hmm in a familiar environment. And look how easy it is. So after you have initialized hardware, then we just have an update display, and then update display gets updated as, as soon as anything changes in this case. And we're going to say, draw text at zero, zero. I mean, like, I don't know IoT, but I know this. And that's what makes me happy. Look, the ternary operator in C Sharp, like this is C Sharp that you already know, which is super fun. Yeah, and I think that's what's really amazing about Mono when it's running all these devices that, yeah, we're, we're, our skills are transplantable. Absolutely. Look, it sounds like some of our friends in the chat room are a little inspired and they want to know, will the source code be shared? Uh, I don't see why not, actually. We've got this source code right now. 
uh, over here, I think it's hidden, but there's no reason we couldn't make this thing that we were messing around with uh, public. Is that okay with you? Oh, yeah, absolutely. No, it's early days, but you can see right now, this is uh, about an hour ago when we got all this stuff working. You can see the FM radio code. Uh, we were working on that as much as, as recently as an hour ago. And then the e-paper display. I want to do point out, to be clear, that this is a beta. We're on beta oh, three yes. yeah. of Meadow. Uh, I think it's like th beta. Th yeah, Meadow beta three. Think, yeah, three point one, I believe. Three point yeah. one beta three, and it's so it's very early here. Who knows when it'll be done? Things will change. Your mileage may vary. Yada yada yada. Yes. But go and explore uh, our friends at Wilderness Labs and their website, and talk to them. This was actually a successful Kickstarter. And they're kicking out these now. You can go and watch a video about how this uh, this project uh, works and how it is uh, going to ho hopefully move forward and do a lot of really cool stuff. Yeah, absolutely. Lots still coming. Um, so if we still need add Wi-Fi support for some Bluetooth, mm -hmm. um, there's some performance improvements coming, plus a lot more you know driver surface. Yeah, yeah. Um, if I go and look at my device manager right now, and I can see right here, I can see ports, and there's. The serial device. Now, this is actually kind of a, a fun thing or fun hack that folks do. Uh, if you have a Circuit Python device from Adafruit, you plug it in. It looks like a disk drive. Right. In this case, it looks like a COM port because it's kind of a universal bus that yes. makes talking to these things really, really easily. And in fact, uh, if I remember correctly, there's also a. Uh, let me. I'm on my desktop here. Let's go to desktop meadow. There is a actually a CLI as well, a command line interface. Maybe we can do a little something with that. Yeah, absolutely. So the CLI um, is really it's the the proof of concept for all the communication to Meadow, and this is what's actually powering the the Visual Studio extension. Mm -hmm. So if I go and say, uh, can I see like file system lists? We'll go like dash dash list files. Yes, exactly. Let's see if that works. There you go. So I just said list files. Said port com three opened, getting a list of files. Oops, you can see there that it says. Mono is currently enabled, so it's turned on right here. Um, if it was disabled, maybe we might be formatting the file system or flashing a new firmware on top of it, right? Well, so actually, so interesting for the command line, um, we'll, we'll toggle mono off and on mm -hmm. so we can work with the device without automatically executing the application. Mm. So we mentioned that- right now, are, you plug it in, it runs. It just runs, right? That, that idea that it's single purpose, so it automatically runs the, it, it looks for actually app.exe, mono fires up, so you can disable mono, allow you to interact the file system without the app running. Mm -hmm. And then these are just the DLLs. That's yeah, just that's exactly right what you mono. need, right? Exactly. So let's think about the layers here, right? You got like system.object, the Meadow Foundation. You can see the drivers for your uh, your FM radio on your screen, right? The Meadow stuff that's underneath, Meadow.foundation, and then the graphics library to uh, output to the screen, draw the text, yeah. decode yeah, bitmaps, yeah. whatever it needs to go. And that, actually, that's a good call out, and that's just code to manipulate data in memory. It's just buffering. Which is a really great point, actually. If we go back over to that and take a look at the graphics library, what's fun about these things is you can find out about the underneath. Like, there's nothing hidden here. You're not hiding anything from us. You're like, look, that's a real font. What's in there? It's the the width of a height in eight by eight, right? So this is actually we uh, built a little tool. This is actually a it was a WPF application. You used yeah. to design the fonts by hand. You just went and draw it in and, and it saved into a. I believe a byte array, if I recall yeah. correctly. And when you go and you do these things, it's like, okay, you know, pull it out of the font table. Yeah. <laughs> this is it. When there's nothing else uh, hiding from you there. Look, there's all your fonts. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and that's very common in this kind of a tiny environment, right? Yeah, because of course they're they're super small, super efficient. Right. So we go back to our camera here and take a look at what this font looks like. I'm just going to bring it around to the other side of the camera here. Well, the camera's coming up. Is this hard coded to a particular version of Mono, or can it be updated? So I will actually show you in just a moment here. See, there you go. So there's the font that we're drawing on the screen right there. Maybe that's the 8x12. The 8x12 yeah. one, right, exactly. So th let's think about the versions and the, how, how these things work. For example, I received my board when I got mine for my Kickstarter on version 3.0 of this operating system. So I plugged it in. And you have to think about the layers, right? And correct me if I'm wrong here. but. It, by default, it boots up into Mono with Mono enabled. It looks for AppEXE and it runs. You turn it on and it runs. But uh, if I hit reset while it's plugged in, it's going to go into this device firmware updating mode, and then I could go and run DFU util, lash the operating system on top of it. Yeah. All of that's bundled and included with that. So when I downloaded it, this is Mono here. Yes, exactly. And the stuff in it, and that comes with the with the Meadow. So I, we are kind of dependent upon the folks that are working on this with their version of Mono to make this work. Yes, and so um, 
Yeah, I mean there are there are there is some parts of Mono that are deployed with the deployment with the OS itself itself, and then that, actually that MS Core live we deploy as a NuGet package. Yeah, it's like a separate pull down. Uh, in terms of being up to date, latest version of Mono, uh, without miss, I don't want to overstate. My understanding is the intention is to keep it up to date. Yep. And so when changes are made to Mono, those will be pulled into the version of Mono that gets deployed on Meadow. So. Pretty amazing stuff. I just wanted to share it with you all. I thought it was so cool. Uh, again, I'm not affiliated with this company, but uh, they seem really cool. Wildernesslabs.co. Um, they had a Kickstarter. I'm a supporter. I think it's great. You can see I've got my kit that I got from them, as well as the, the Wilderness Labs piece of wood on which the breadboard is mounted. So uh, this is just an example of kind of the great stuff that happens with open source and .NET. And thank you for uh, for hanging out with me. Thank you so much for inviting me in. So yeah, absolutely, cool. Uh, now what, Jeff Fritz? Now we're gonna bring in our other hosts, and we're gonna set up for our next guest. Deuces. Next See y'all later. All right.